Hello and welcome, or welcome back, depending on how frequently you attend to this, to DWeb Decoded, uh, the regular podcast that we put out at the Filecoin Foundation, exploring some of the movers and shakers and uh, uh, ideas and projects that are defining uh, the re-decentralization of the internet and the web, hence the name. Um, I'm joined today by uh, Michael Cutt. Uh, Mike uh, is, um, let me read you the official bio and then we can go into what you really are. Um, Mike Hawker has been a technology journalist for more than a decade. He started as a magazine fact checker at the MIT uh, Tech Review, where he eventually rose to be a full-time reporter. In 2015, while a colleague was out on paternity leave, I love that little detail, <laughs> Mike stepped in to cover a Bitcoin conference and he has been exploring the complicated and bizarre crypto rabbit hole ever since. Uh, most importantly, I think many people will know Mike from uh, the crypto letter, uh, chain letter, um, and also at the block. Um, but these days, uh, he's mainly working on Project Glitch, uh, a newsletter focused on the future of the internet and digital spaces with an emphasis on crypto networks. Mike, it's really good to have you here. Thanks for having me, Danny. I really appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to launch in because, like, basically, this is my favorite part of. Possibly crypto and mainly maybe technology as a whole, which is the intersection between the technology and the culture, either the culture that it first intersects with or the culture it kind of generates itself. Um, so when you came in at 2015, like... How were you? How were you intersecting with those Bitcoiners? Were you coming in as someone who's like, "Yep, yeah, I'm on the MIT Technology Review beat. I'm just, you know, one day I'm writing about brains, the next day I'm writing about like, you know, mainframes," or did you uh, already have an interest in this particular culture? Uh, it was more the first, uh, the first way you described it. Um, I was still sort of a junior reporter on staff and taking any opportunities to write whatever I could get. Um, and so when, um, like I said, a colleague uh, stepped out, um, he had been writing about Bitcoin a little bit. And we'd been talking about it in our newsroom as another sort of emerging technology, like we talked about other things, like it might like a, like a new material that could be used to generate solar power. Um, right. or a new drug component or something like that. And so that's really the way that I came into it. And then were you, you obviously ended up going completely in that direction. I mean, were, were you drawn by the applications or were you drawn by the wacky cryptoness <laughs> of the whole thing? <laughs> right. I remember, so when I went to this conference in 2015 and it was in New York City, um, I remember being mostly confused um, by what was happening, but slightly intrigued as well. Um, it seemed like these people knew what they were talking about, even if I had no idea sort of what it was exactly. And there were a lot of venture capitalists there who were investing oh. in this thing. And there were people talking about Bitcoin companies. Um, and like I said, I sort of kind of understood it as a computing technology up to that point, And one that was that didn't seem to kind of gel that well with the typical idea of a startup. So I was confused at that point. Um, but, 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 but then I think what, what got me hooked um, along with sort of some kind of professional uh, forces at play uh, were the ideas, the, the idea that uh, you could have a computer network that was controlled by the public essentially, um, as opposed to what we had grown accustomed to. Were you, where were you based? Were you based in New York or? I was based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, right, uh, right off campus um, at MIT. Because I, I find this kind of interesting too, in the, if you look at sort of the, um, almost the constructed history of a lot of things. So there was, there was this, and I think you're, I don't know whether this is flattering or insulting, right? But like looking at the glitch, you know, there's an element of sort of gonzoness to your, your coverage. And there was this period of, uh, that I think coincided with the explosion in sort of computers in the popular imagination technology in the seventies where, um, something that, you know, was 
was ba- basically kind of in the category of accountancy or, you know, at best maybe plastics or a new material right. that can do solar power, got the attention of journalists who wrote about it as a subculture. So you have like um, uh, Stuart Brand and those folks kind of writing about the uh, the hacker culture. Um, and then Stephen Levy's Hackers, which if anybody hasn't read that, that's a great kind of prelude, kind of ends with Richard Stallman and the free software movement. So it's a great prelude to this stuff. Um, one of the things I find kind of fascinating about that is so much of that culture was defined around Cambridge, Massachusetts, right? People think about Silicon Valley now, but um, that the hacker ethos that that a lot of early crypto stuff kind of draws on um, is definitely from that MIT hacker world. Mm-hmm. Is that something that like you kind of knew – was that something that informed the tech reviews kind of coverage or was that something that was sort of in the history books by that point? That's a really interesting question. I'm not sure if it sort of uh, defined our coverage, but we, I think by virtue of being around MIT people and being on campus and then also sort of having MIT uh, looking over our shoulder to some degree, um, we let some of that culture seep in. And I think, but I think where it, it came into play for us is that we took fringe technologies like Bitcoin seriously. Um, We were skeptical of it, but we took it seriously. And it wasn't just because we were, we were technology journalists who took technology seriously. um, Generally, it was also because at MIT, serious people at MIT seem to be taking it seriously as well. And we, we, we tended to look to those people for cues. Um, and MIT started uh, the digital currency initiative pretty early on actually right. uh, to start working on Bitcoin and has always taken Bitcoin and consensus mechanisms and distributed networks very seriously. Yeah, I think uh, here in the West Coast, um, it, the same thing played out, right? With like Stanford mm-hmm. and I guess Stan Bone is there, mm-hmm. um, you know, we, not not just the the, the startup y MBA ish kind of land, but like cryptographers um, right. were going, okay, no, actually this is sort of this is an interesting development mm-hmm. and connects to uh, a few other things. There's this funny parallel. I think oh God, I'm always worried that I'm retelling stories on this podcast. But I got to hang out with some of the early um, Stanford AI folks. Um, uh, at the same time as the the Stanford uh, blockchain event, what's that called? Um, something like that. Anyway, and uh, these the, the AI, so just for context, the old school AI is also where a lot of this sort of hacker kind of individualist uh, approach came from. And these guys are in their seventies or eighties now. Anyway, we were in for a walk and like there was all this blockchain stuff going on. There was like somebody with, you know, incredibly complicated zero proof equations on the, on the projector, but like crowds of people and people drinking kind of cocktails in the back. And I was like, well, what do you think? Like Mm -hmm. AI stalwarts. Mm -hmm. And they were like, I think it's very clever how Mm -hmm. the cryptographers have worked out how to get funding. (laughs) <laughs> and, and you know of course ai has gone through we're seeing it now uh, like these huge booms and interest mm-hmm. in what was originally you know is an obs- is basically statistics right so you kind of wrote about this but you were also watching the coverage and the encapsulation of this in the press and the wider media uh, and I think we've seen that arc go from what's this crazy digital coins in a e wallet kind of writing to these people are from Satan and everything in between. Like, how does that how does how does that crystallize as a mainstream viewpoint from your point of view as someone who is, I guess, sort of passively contributing to it, but is also heavily influenced by how that, right. that that is incarnated. 
I think there are a lot of factors um, that play into it. Obviously, one of them is the sort of roller coaster of the the moving price and the market and the way that that drives drives attention in and of itself. Um, and then there's sort of some derivatives of that. Um, one being, I think that the crypto media sees that attention and wants naturally wants to capitalize on that attention and kind of doubles down on 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 making things making the markets and the finance aspect and the, the moving prices sort of the, the centerpiece of the, of the storytelling right um, and and then on the other hand um, I think this like going back to my memory of being a tech review and I still write for them and so I know that um, it's the, the the technology journalism there is is distinct from from say the New York Times or, or the Washington Post or, or Bloomberg to name a few that might that might write some about technology as well, in the sense that there's there's a little bit more. I think I want to call it academic rigor, and part of that is I think related to what I said before about how we're we were, were on campus at MIT and we sort of had to answer to MIT to some degree. Not that they had editorial con- editorial influence, but we we needed to live up to certain standards. Um, and so the technology journalism at Tech Review. Uh, and, and we had sort of a luxury of having the, the I guess, the, the resources to to slog through technical literature and jargon and get get on the phone, chase researchers who didn't really want to talk to us and get on the phone with them and ask them stupid questions. And we didn't have to rush this stuff out the door necessarily. Right. So when we would so we would take the time and we would say, OK, well, we've talked to enough people to think that this might be kind of. Uh, some percentage hype, but also some percentage real, and we need to kind of focus on what makes it what makes it real. Um, and I don't think that the incentives in the in the traditional media, the mainstream media, so to speak, are the same. Um, and that's I think fair enough. The audience is kind of the same, or kind of is the audience is different, and um, the the time that reporters spend on things and the the payoff for, for the work that they put into whatever they're going to cover is different. The structure is different. Um, so when things come up in crypto, bad things, fraud, crime, terrorist financing, those types of things, those types of things need to be covered. They would be covered regardless of the, the underlying technology. It's just right. that it seems like that's all the mainstream media cares about, which Maybe there's a little bit of truth to that, but 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 sort of why is that? I think that that's an interesting question. Maybe it's because uh, the the sort of under grasping some of the narratives inside of the crypto ecosystem is very difficult because it's they're so uh, full of jargon and made up words and also just kind of just technically complicated to begin with. And yeah. so I think mainstream reporters kind of are hesitant to to wade into that. Yeah, I realize that we're gonna this 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 episode is going to be the sort of like foray into like the meta nature of journalism, <laughs> crypto journalism. So, so I always have this vision of who our listeners are and it's probably wrong, but like I, I think of a, them as people who are interested in the decentralized web and building these decentralized, right. decentralized tools and stuff. And so just to so contextualize this as to, I think this is always, I think it's always really interesting to unpick the machinery of, of coverage because I think people often have a very, not simplistic view of it, but a very, it goes from A to B, a man comes or a woman comes right. and asks me a question and then it becomes this thing mm-hmm. and then it's wrong. Um, and all the different directions and routes that can go into influences are always like one of the ones is I, 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 I used to be a tech journalist. So one of the ones that would drive me crazy is just the ponderousness of it will take you this amount of time to explain this concept, right? Like let's say hashing, right? And you can't rely on somebody knowing anything about hashing at the beginning of the story. So you have to like start explaining that. Um, and then you finish explaining about hashing, and so great. Now you can get into talking about you know CIDs or how this can protect data or content addressable systems. But you've already used <laughs> like four hundred words, so there's a limit to how much technical explanation you can put into it, even even if the concept 
is something that a reasonably intelligent person would be able to wrap their wrap their head around. Right. Um, and I feel like crypto particularly suffers from this, but and non blockchainy kind of dis- distributed systems because you build on these abstract units, but the abstract units aren't intuitive, right? Like right. coverage of this stuff has been stuck describing what a blockchain is <laughs> for, for years. Mm-hmm. And you never, it's so hard to get to the cultural impact of that mm-hmm. or yeah, why you might true. do it in the first place. I think that's true. And I think another thing that's different is that the, there, there aren't so many experts in it as much as there are sort of experts in a very specific piece of it. And mm-hmm. it's hard to get big picture expertise the way that you might about another topic, another technology right. topic. Uh, and that, that, that makes it hard to explain things to begin with because sometimes the defi- even the definitions of things are still in dispute or sometimes the, 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 the words that, that, that we've settled on are just not very good, like smart contract maybe is not the greatest right. term. Right. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> the, um, uh, but then again, you know, one of the weird things about that is the, that has like a history that preceded all of the blockchain stuff, right? Like smart contracts comes from a previous generation of these things. When you were starting on this, so 2015 is either extremely early in crypto or quite late. <laughs> like it was a moment though, right? And did you feel that you were riding that curve up as a sort of day to day reporter? Or did you feel you had time to sort of dig into? the roots of where this had come from? I had time. I think um, I started sort of, I still was kind of a general assignment reporter from 2015 until around 2017. Um, and then that was when the ICO stuff started to happen. Right. And the, the business side of Tech Review essentially asked, is the way I understand it, asked the editorial team to launch a crypto vertical. And I'd been the only one that, had written you about were that vertical Bitcoin <laughs> on staff. So that's when I launched the, the newsletter. Um, but at that point is when I had a chance to really dig in because we needed at, at that point it was a buy, it was we were sending the newsletter twice a week. And we needed oh, wow. content. And it could it didn't necessarily have to be super tied to the news. So I was given license to basically go exploring and try to figure out what I thought was important and try to figure out what I thought should be explained and see if I could do that in sort of a small space and quickly. And so it was, it was sort of half kind of overwhelming, like overwhelming fire hose speed and sort of half thoughtful the way that tech review likes to be. So it's right, an interesting right. mixture of those things. And I think the, the glitch has sort of continued in that tradition. Like you spent some time sort of just doing regular reportage, but you're back into this sort of newsletter form, a format that I love. And uh, as we said, you're sort of crossing the streams between kind of just keeping people abreast of what's going on in this space and trying to delve a little bit deeper into the cultural roots. Do you have like a sort of like internal manifesto of what the like what the voice of the of, of the glitch should be? I think we're developing that, but I think we have a pretty good idea uh, that we want to be uh, distinct in the sense that we want to be distinct from the crypto media. And there's a lot of work being good work being done in the crypto media. Um, but I want to be we also want to be distinct from the traditional media. And right. we, we want to. I think the voice is that we 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 take these things seriously. We take these technologies seriously. We don't necessarily expect them to uh, have killer apps overnight. It's more like where are these things going over the long term? And how do they fit into the big picture? Um, and it's certainly not cheerleading for that to happen, but to some degree, it is a bet on that happening because, and that's I base that on just watching this space for so long because right. I think that things actually, a lot of things have happened um, beneath the surface uh, over the past several years that maybe the traditional media has missed. And so I think the bet is that these technologies will become more important and will become something that 
that more people want to learn about. And hopefully we can be there sort of with welcome, welcoming arms um, to, to let to give them a place to start because the crypto yeah. media might not be the best place to start. Yeah, I mean, or at least a head start, right? That I feel that, that you know, it's in this sort of boom and bust, which you do see in a lot of, uh, of technology, what you have is like a huge influx of capital, huge overdevelopment of and funding of things that are basically kind of interesting and extensions of basic research and mm -hmm. extensions of the field. And then this period where people try and work out uh, what applications people are actually interested in. Right. I think, so my, and we should probably get some folks in this, from this space on the podcast to talk about this. So I feel like one of those buckets is sort of zero knowledge stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And I see that, that you're sort of tracking that um, pretty, pretty carefully. I mean, do you, was that one of those areas that you've always had an interest in, or is it something that you've seen emerging in that post ICO world? Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it does. It dates back to my time at Tech Review, where my challenge was to dig beyond all of the noise and hype and figure out where were where were actual innovations occurring. And I gravitated toward Zcash and learned about Zcash. Um, right. because it seemed genuinely new and right. I learned about zero knowledge proofs back then. And I actually, and I'm very proud of this, managed to get it onto our 10 breakthrough technologies list in 2019, I believe. So that's a few nice. years ago now. <laughs> um, and I think it took a lot to convince the, the editors at tech review at the time, but I think that, that, that I had a sense that it was, it was, it was going somewhere because it was a, it, it made a real difference. It, it, even if it was research level. Right. And I think that there was some sense that in the same as way as AI, where you just see the number of papers kind of slowly increase. And it's not so much like there's been this amazing breakthrough so much as something has happened that's meant that there are a bunch of like really interesting incremental breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. So, um, in our world, Filecoin obviously uses zero knowledge proofs in a particular way to, to uh, prove without revealing that data, prove that data is being stored without revealing what that data is. Um, that was somewhat of a bet because at the time that, that that was being sort of sketched out, the pieces weren't yet available. Right, you could see the direction the zero knowledge proofs were going, but no one had constructed those kind of those kind of proofs. Mm -hmm. And I, I also I also find it sort of super interesting to watch companies and individuals who are kind of it's not so you have researchers and they're concentrating on their research, and then you have people going, okay, I bet by the time. I'm here. This will have got here. So we're gonna we're gonna aim to intersect with this fast moving, this fast moving tech. Is it still as fast moving as it was in the sort of days of of, of your of 2022? Are like things slowing down, or are they? Is it just sort of ticking along now? Mm, that's actually kind of hard to say. Um, that's a good question. I think that the the sort of craziness about launching new tokens and and all of that um, has has died down. But with respect to the zero knowledge space specifically, it seems like it's moving very quickly, and that seems like a product of the fact that people are are building have built a lot of tools in the past several years. Tools that right. were required in order to make things, and now people are starting to use those tools to make things. Um, but what, what I think sort of what I think is most interesting about this, about zero knowledge technology, zero, zero knowledge cryptography in the context of, oh, I guess, the evolution of technology was that it was kind of forged by crypto. It was forged inside of this blockchain crypto space. But it now that we can see how it might transcend the, the crypto space. It might have applications beyond crypto, um, but it but it may not have gotten to that point without crypto, which I think is pretty interesting. Can you dig into that a little bit more? I mean, because I, one of the things I do struggle with ZK stuff is 
conveying the applications, right? Uh, mostly I just have to go, kind of just have to trust me that it like feels like a thing that would be useful. But are you seeing the shape of what those non-cryptocurrency applications are? I think one, you mentioned Dan Bonet. I think that he and some other researchers at Stanford, a good example is a, a system that they've developed that could be used to verify that, for example, an image that appears in a, in a news article has not been edited sort of outside some set of prescribed, prescribed constraints, um, which could be useful. Um, there's yeah. kind of a meme that, that, that ZK could, could help us distinguish what's human and what's not um, in the age of AI. I think that's mostly an idea, but that's a co- pretty good concrete example of, of that idea, I think. Yeah, I think that this, this sort of general area of we can continue to process data, um, but we can process that data sort of under a veil so that whoever's doing the processing the data in that sort of, you know, homomorphic encryption kind of world doesn't need to know about what what it's doing. Um, but also this sense that we can prove a process has happened as well, which are both of which are sort of these areas of darkness for, for most of us, right? We don't know what's happened to data or what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and at this point, people don't really notice that they're, um, they're, they're relying on, on their trust with things um, or companies or, or even the hardware that they use. But at some point, they're going to really appreciate having some some evidence that, like, oh yeah, this was the photo that that we we originally um, we originally wanted. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. There may be other opportunities. I think in just credentials. This has been an idea that's been around for a long time, like sort of using the blockchain to 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 store identity credentials or or other kinds of credentials. And I think zero knowledge makes that more realistic in, in private. Um, so there was there's a, there's an application called ZooPass, which was oh, right. developed which was developed at. Zuzalu. Zoo, I want to make sure I say that. I think that's how they say it. You haven't. This, I've never said it, so I was going <laughs> to wait for you to say it. I don't think I've heard. Maybe I've heard someone say it. So maybe you should give some background to the the land of Zuzalu. Zoo, Zoo, well, Zoo Zoo well Zoo I don't know a ton okay. about it, but I know that it was a, a sort of a, a a step towards this idea of a network state, which is sort of popular idea in crypto circles, and it was focused on. Um, kind of various things, but longevity uh, science took a, a big role in this particular gathering. Um, and I think that there you were some, surprise some, me. Yeah, anyway, some other crypto <laughs> things <laughs> involved. Well, one of the things was this thing called ZooPass, which, which is a system that allowed people to prove that they were allowed to be there without revealing who they were. Uh, right. And that system was used uh, in Istanbul for another Ethereum conference that my colleague Lucy uh, was able to test out. She said it worked pretty well. It's it's a pretty simple concept, but you could imagine it being built upon. There are plenty of creative people in crypto, um, and maybe it's a building block of sorts. I think that this so this this very neatly intersects with this idea of tech and culture. Writing about them both, like because I think another one of the challenges is that. Um, in, in, in reporting. And th- I think this is something that really grinds people's wheels, but I'm like, you know, this, everybody faces this, which is the reporting class. So we say, or like the sort of people who go into journalism are probably quite a few hops away from the kind of people who end up in crypto or maybe not really, but like, you know, maybe different different paths at like MIT or Stanford or whatever, they're still kind of elites of a sort, right? Or American elites. Um, but that means that, that there's often a big culture gap in explaining it or even understanding people's motivations. Like I nodded along going, oh yeah, that, that crowd would be totally into long lev- longevity, <laughs> right? Mm. And for somebody coming into this space for the first time, particularly as a reporter, and coming in going, okay, I don't get this. I came here to report on zero knowledge proofs. These people want to create their own society (sighs) and their own city, and also they want to live forever. 
<laughs> and how do you, okay, first of all, where, where do you see yourself as like sitting in that? Are you kind of this distant ethnographer? Are you like, well, if you're going to like live forever, maybe hit me up. <laughs> um, uh, are you someone who has come into this just as being, it being a weird world and then kind of bought into it a little bit? Like what, or are you a critic? Like what, what how, what stance do you presume to have? I presume to, I think I take, this is, I, this is maybe kind of an annoying answer, but I think there's a, there's a sort of core journalistic value system that I have when, that I take towards new things where I want to learn from people who participated before I speak definitively about them. And so uh, right. it's, it's sort of a stepwise process. And in this case, I haven't I've had a chance to speak with a few people and I've read some things about it. Um, and, and it sounds, the whole idea sounds obviously pretty bizarre, but I think that there are some, some real aspects to it that I think are worth asking questions about and talking about, whether that be critiquing them or explaining them or just sort of trying to reframe them for a broader discussion. I think that, that that's that's where that's those are the kinds of things I want to do, and that's, those are the kinds of things I want to do with Glitch. So I don't want to necessarily pass judgment on any of the stuff that's happening at Zuzalu, um, but I want to write about it well enough so that someone, if if they're inclined to pass judgment, then they might they might have some evidence that would support an argument that that would be critical of it. Yeah, I think that there's a I, I rem again going back to sort of tech review. I think um, I vaguely remember that there was a issue that was about human life extension mm. and uh, the editor, and you may be able to remind me of his name, wrote an editorial editor of the, of the review sort of basically going, I think this is complete rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> this is nonsense, but you know, here we go. And, um, and you know, it was funny because the world was half divided at people who were mad at, at, at the magazine for, you know, covering this because they felt it was, it was, yeah. it wasn't proper science and half people just mad that they weren't covering it in what they felt was an objective enough way. Right. Mm -hmm. They weren't sort of just, just laying it out. And I feel like that is something that, that often tangles people up in covering these areas because you have kind of the aspirations of the community, the consequences of the technology, the distance between those two things, and the fact that, like, as you say, there are no real uninvolved experts, right? Yeah, um, there are a few, but not, not, not many. Right. Um, and sometimes it's hard to know because it's hard to know who's invested in what sometimes. Um, yeah, but. which brings to sort of the other part of it, which is that, I mean, I think part of the interesting part of blockchain as a technology is how it constructs incentives, right? That you, you know, everybody gets incentivized to do a little bit of it and it proceeds. And one of the dangers of that is that suddenly everybody has these incentives and you're sitting there going, okay, are you telling me that this is going to be absolutely brilliant because you believe in it? because you are in, you know you stand to make a lot of money out of it um or sort of you're in a transitional stage right where you're going from the person who wrote the paper to the person who is looking for funding or planning to make it the right. next big thing and all of this contributes to the the media landscape and the way that the media landscape ends up being um is is it has to do with incentives as well. Um, the, right. the crypto media, uh, it does, it does sort of want the technology to succeed, uh, because that's where a lot of the, the advertising revenue and attention is coming from. And that's the tricky balance that we have to walk with at glitch. Right. So, so you also have le the journalistic incentives too. Yeah. That makes sense. I think that the uh, something that tech journalism in particular sort of struggles with, 
me, maybe, I think maybe this is true of lots of, but I, I'm familiar with it, is, has, okay, so has historically been that it sort of kind of needs the tech to also exist, right? The moment when I think one of the, maybe it was the New York Times, I realized that they had a Facebook correspondent. <laughs> they had somebody whose beat was just Facebook. And you go, oh, there are all kinds of potentially broken incentives in this, right? Because one of the things that's hard to, when you're talking about decentralized stuff, is I don't have a trademark, right? I don't have a household name to talk about. I mean, we talked a little bit about Zcash um, and, of course, Ethereum. And those are projects, and Filecoin, those are projects that sort of, have a shape to them, some equivalent of brand familiarity, um, some very prominent figures attached to them, Zuko, Juan, Vitalik. Um, and so that sort of makes them easier to write about in a way. But that adds to the centralizing nature of it all, right? Like if, you know, the entire Ethereum ecosystem is super hanging on whatever Vitalik says, and your job as a journalist is to kind of find out what he said and make it a thing, um, uh, that in itself is a really strong incentive to kind of centralize, if not the, the technology, then sort of the direction of where it should go. It's, I think it's tricky. I think we have to, we have to try to find different starting points as opposed to starting with the, with crypto, maybe we start with an actual something else in the world. And it's not to say that it's not to say that you, then you force the crypto into that. But then, right. if 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 it's correct that these thing that these technologies will solve problems, then eventually there will be real examples where they're solving problems. Uh, so. The other thing is, I think so there's a lot of hype. So this an example of this is that there's a lot of hype. In the in, right now around the idea that crypto and AI can play together because crypto is going to be verifying all the all verifying humanity and verifying all this stuff, um, but there are very few actual concrete examples of that happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not going to write about that as if it's happening, or we're going to try not to. Um, right. All we can really do is say that's Vitalik's idea. That's part of why, in the case of when Vitalik says things, sometimes I just try to put what he says into context because not everyone is going to understand it, um, and what he's what he's saying is 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 going to be influential whether I want it to be or not. At so least within the crypto you, sphere, yeah. So who do you feel that you're writing for these days? Like if you have an image like I did with the, the image of, of who, who is listening to this, who is your image of your audience? Um, it's a good question. And it's one that we we're still trying to work out, but I think that we, we, we know of sort of anecdotally a fair number of people inside of the crypto sphere who do want sort of, a fresh lens on things um, and not just for PR reasons, although I think that that plays a big part, but, but also because they agree with the idea that a lot of interesting things are happening that are not being discussed very broadly. So mm -hmm. I think that we are, we want to meet those people where they are working in the crypto space and meet them, know, know those people and meet them in person and see them talk at conferences and things like that. Uh, but we also want to appeal to uh, people who are smart enough to understand these things, but have not been able to figure out like where they can find an entry point. And maybe it is because of the culture clash that we've talked a lot about, or maybe they've put it off and they've always kind of thought, maybe I should figure out that crypto thing, but they just put it off and then they thought it died and then it came back and then it died again. Right. Um, and, and we're here to help explain some of that crazy stuff, I think. And I think I think a, a winter or whatever you describe this sort of dip is a really good moment for that, right? Because the the noise begins to decrease and the signal begins to rise up, but you kind of have to know your way around the ruins. I'm sure someone's going to judge me for this sort of apocalyptic <laughs> imagery, but but it's true, right? Like you're sitting there going, "Okay, we know that these people are still beavering away mm -hmm. at their at their really sort of 
interesting things. So we talked a little bit about zero knowledge proof. So there are other sort of general areas in this space that you feel there's there's promise of of actual applications. Right. I think well, one that's kind of fun to think about is one that I've written a few stories about, which is this is basically video games that people are trying to create so that they can have their rules encoded in smart contracts as opposed to a corporate server. And um, the the kind of buzzword there is autonomous worlds, which first of the idea that in theory you could set a game world up or an online world, speaking more broadly, that no one really controlled and no one could really shut down. Um, there's a team uh, that I've that I've written about and spoken with a few times who created a custom Minecraft server several years ago, uh, where there were NFTs in the game and cryptocurrency in the game, and there was this economy inside the game. Um, but then Microsoft banned blockchain technology inside of Minecraft. So then that experiment, that world was over. Uh, and so they, that team has is one team that's been developing a, a game called Primodium. Um, and it's, it's sort of a space-based game that's in a playtest that you don't even need a crypto wallet or anything to, to, to play right now. And it's actually pretty fun. I've been playing it. It just runs um, all the time. And there are plenty of projects like this. I think that the the, the challenge for, for, for that scene is to prove that that this needs that a blockchain offers something that's actually interesting beyond the idea. It's kind of what, what all of the crypto the crypto stuff is like. Um, but it, but, but it, if they can get it to work and some of these, I think layer two scaling platforms are going to make it easier to compute, using a blockchain than it was before. And then even zero knowledge proofs could be used to help uh, do things off chain, for example, and then verify on chain. Like for example, you could have uh, an, like a, a combat occur uh, in real time off chain, and then you could verify on chain that the combat occurred according to the rules correctly and that this player won, for instance. Right. I think some of this stuff, uh, uh, one of the things that the, you see like some some of this is about trust right and who do you trust and what do you put your trust in and of course one of the tensions between the centralized web and the decentralized web is in the centralized one you put these trust in these in these big companies and we do this all the time and then it's only when they sort of betray this trust that you go oh no what was i doing Mm -hmm. um and look around for for alternatives um so in some of, and the the counter problem, right, is that if you put your trust in a technology, and then the technology either fails or fails to persist, um, then you're in as bad a place or worse uh, the, than if you you trusted a bunch of people. Um, so I think one of the things that's sort of always interesting but hard to predict is which one of these projects is going to just not fail right it's going to persist like the longer a space game like that goes the more complicated it becomes and the more faith people have in this being something that is going to be better than um the 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 sort of uh institutionally um uh, generated right and then how does if it's if it's possible how does the blockchain allow coordination maybe within the game that wasn't possible before or something right. else. Um, right. Some sort of marketplace that wasn't possible um, before. Um, for example, one of the resources in the game is very scarce and it's very difficult to progress in the game um, right. without, without accumulating it. <laughs> but, but so, so there, there's, there's a, there's a, a potential there for, for a more complicated marketplace that exists just solely within the game that nobody ever had to. I mean, at some point someone had to get crypto somehow. Um, but then once you're, once you're in the game, um, then, then, um, you can, you, you don't have to prove who you are or anything like that. You can just use it. So I think one of the things that makes this 
both hard to cover and and interesting right is that it's the intersection of technology and social organization in the a game like that part of it is you can hard code what is going on but also who makes those rules and i think as a journalist you end up covering both the technology and politics isn't quite the word right word and neither is gossip <laughs> but it's the it's it's the you know what people are doing within a project and who is working with who is as important about predicting the future of those projects as the technology itself is that right. something that interests you or like is that how does that fit in 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 the coverage that you're doing mm, i think that's that's what people ethereum people call the social layer or mm. sometimes maybe governance is a is a more boring way to put it but mm. i think it fits in because at the end of the day these systems these systems work because of humans and potentially for humans or in spite of humans but humans are involved um and so the system in it's arguable that the system that the systems need the humans to work that the humans are even part of the systems that the humans are part of the technologies that humans are an extension of technology so i think you always have to understand the motivations um the incentives uh and the role that the humans play in any technology in any technology development or any any in the individual development of an application or a whole class of technology um and that is that is as we've discussed this whole time what makes crypto unique the other big question we've talked a lot about other people's incentives is uh this ongoing discussion about how journalism can make money um or or be self-sustained as um as a as an act in itself right you are you it's always it's push come to shove right where you go oh yeah like do i do this in a crypto native kind of way or do i just ask people to get the credit cards out and what is your thinking about that? How do you see yourself as being able to create a sustainable crypto journalism venture that isn't term, compromised? Yeah, I think so. I think we, in terms of payments, I, I think we haven't, I think we're pretty young. Um, right now, all of our content is free. We have a few people that are paying us through Substack, um, which is very nice of them, very generous of them. I think we would be happy to take crypto payments in that context. We would probably convert them um, because I think when, when you have an investment asset with a moving price, then you are rooting for that number to go up, even if you mm -hmm. don't realize it. Uh, so I don't really want to be have too much of a stake in that um, as a journalist. That th there's a danger, I think, where I don't actually know how the stuff works, maybe sometimes, or I don't, I'm not familiar with some of the mundane aspects of, of, of a cryptocurrency user's day to day. And maybe that right. shows up in my writing sometimes, but um, I think that that's sort of part of the price that I, that I'll, that I'll need to pay if I, if I want to do this. And that's what I want to do right now. Yeah. Yeah. I think this goes back to this thing of like, what, where should a journalist sit in, in something like this mm -hmm. where you have to be, you know, you have to be in the arena to coin a phrase, um, uh, to some extent, but you're not actually supposed to be battling in the arena. I guess you're supposed to be just some sort of weird passerby who has climbed over the fence and is peering, <laughs> peering at the gladiators. Right. Um, do, do you, are you ever tempted to sort of take the technologies that you see that you're writing about and use them uh, in in your day to day journalistic work, or is that crossing the line too? I think I've I've started to feel that in the context of these uh, these games, um, in part because I just want to play the games, and like this one that I just mentioned is fun, um, right? And I, and then I think that if someone were to come up with some convincing technology that does somehow address uh, um, deep fakes or uh, 
fraudulently edited the images, then that's not like we were talking before. That's not pure crypto, but it's it's still it's still crypto. It's it's cryptography, and it was born, I think, in the crypto scene. Mm-hmm. Um, and then things like ZooPass and the idea that you might be able to privately prove certain things about yourself. That's pretty compelling to me. Um, mm-hmm. None of those things are financial, really, in in nature, right. um, and and they don't seem like they would be something that would compromise my journalistic ethics in the sense that I described before, where there's a moving price and and you want it to go up, whether you know it, whether you know it or not. Yeah, I think there's a theme going through a lot of this that that um, you. The, the thing that people ended up concentrating on, I mean, not just journalists, but everyone, right, was, was the currency bit of cryptocurrency, right? The idea that it was, it was in a positive view, a new form of stock market and negative view, kind of this casino. Um, but the interesting stuff is, is, is around the edges of that and maybe the most practical, useful parts of it. And that's the thing that, that, I think that's the thing that everybody's looking for, but also as a journalist, you're kind of looking for too, because that's the thing that connects those two dots. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Right. So, and I think, so I think my experience writing about other technologies has prepared me for this to take longer than all of the mar- marketing people said it would, but, right. that, but that at some point it will just be here. Right. And then the, then, then the challenge is making it interesting again, because I think, I think about <laughs> solar cells a lot. I mean, I was writing about um, it more on a research level early, in the early 2010s, but, 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 but now it's just, a, it's just a ubiquitous thing. People, it depends on where you are, obviously, but in, in certain places, everyone has solar panels on their, on their roofs. Right, right. There are solar panel magazines but they're not as mainstream as solar panels are now. Right? It's not a popular science concept anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Mike, thank you very much for giving that, that insight into where things are right now. If people want to follow you and your team, Project Glitch is, is on where's Substack. the best place to find it? It's Substack. on Substack, okay. yeah, projectglitch.substack.com. Um, I'm also on Twitter, uh, at Mike underscore Orcut. Um, so my, Great. Just my first first name underscore last name. And um, if, uh, if if what is it okay if people want you to write about them for them to ping you too? Yes, ex- yes. We we want we want to we want to hear from people. Um, we want we want to learn about what they're doing. We want to learn why they're doing it. And we can't promise that that means we're going to cover you. Um, but the more that we know, the better we will be able to cover the space on the whole. And what we can, what we can say is that that's going to be good for everyone that's working in the space. At least that's what we would like to think. Yeah. And the better you are, I think the more we, we get to know. So thanks very much, Mike. Thank you very much.